YouTube, what it do? It's your boy King Zay back in the stew. Now y'all, today we got a very long video. By long, I mean 20 minutes. I never really, I, I try to make sure my reaction never viz 20 minutes plus. But I figure I just dropped this on Sunday. So just go ahead, get your snacks, relax, and enjoy. We got the boy who grew up to kill 35 people in 24 hours. <laughs> Let's get straight to it. The snakes, spiders, and sharks are the deadliest things in Australia. Just wait until you learn more about today's killer, who only needed one day to take the lives of 35 people and destroy the lives of countless others. That is crazy. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today His mind we're definitely to be unraveling the explosive story behind Martin Bryant. The most. His name would be Martin. He looked like a Martin, a Marty. Notorious mass murderer in Australia's history and a man responsible for one of the worst single person mass shootings the world has ever seen. The Port Arthur Massacre. It's been 25 years since this tragic event, which has since resulted in the Australian state placing extensive restrictions on gun laws. And the buyback scheme was initiated in which 643,000 firearms were handed back, which cost the government around three hundred and fifty million dollars but the country God, no. no longer allows adults to purchase any type of fire without a license martin bryant was born on the 7th of may 1967 at the queen alexandra hospital in hobart tasmania she the first the child of maurice and carlene bryant the couple couldn't possibly know the horrors that were because of their you know a violent Imagine. and disruptive child. Martin was severely bullied at school. This led Martin to becoming the bully to children younger than him and weaker than him. This behavior led to some quick punishment, with Martin being suspended from Newtown Primary School in 1977 at just the age of 10 years old. He would soon Start undergo the early. first of many psychological assessments. Here it was discovered that Martin liked to kill and torture animals. I don't want to pause this a lot, but that's how a lot of killers start, bro. They start torturing little insects, and they go on to, like, bigger and bigger animals. Then they just start killing folks, bro. So y'all watch out, man. That dude in your high school, bro, that's right now just killing, what, killing rats and, and, and gerbils, bro. Watch out for him. Just watch out for him. That's all I'm going to say. The following year, in 1978, Martin returned to school with greatly improved behavior. But it wasn't to last. After failing to befriend any of his classmates, he returned to bullying the Dang. other children. When he was just 14 years old, Martin got his first firearm. Oh Lord! An air rifle that his father had bought for Y'all messed up right the there. The young boy would carelessly fire the weapon from a distance at drivers passing by and shoot down birds. This what? This cruel habit of killing innocent animals earned the boy the nickname Silly Martin. With children saying that just he doing had no casual drive by, no feeling for other living creatures. High school wasn't much better for Martin as he was transferred to a special education unit at Newtown High School in 1980 to help with his learning disabilities. In 1983, after he left school, the boy was assessed with a disability pension. In his assessment, the psychologist wrote that the young man could not read nor write, although he was able to guard it. His he was too busy playing with him guns. Further deterioration, and due to the possibility that their son could be schizophrenic, they faced a bleak future with him. Through this assessment, Martin was awarded the disability pension, although he also worked as a handyman and a gardener. His mental disabilities are possibly one of the main reasons he had such a difficult time connecting with others, and what ultimately led to one of the most horrific mass shootings in the world. For the next five years, Martin remained at home with his parents, doing odd handyman jobs locally. In early 1987, when he was 19 years old, Martin finally made his first real connection with another person. A 54-year-old woman called Helene Mary Elizabeth. Never mind. She was an heiress to a share in the Tattersall's lottery. Making connections with old ladies. Martin came across Miss Harvey 
whilst looking for Don't tell me he killed her. Please tell me he ain't killed her. Miss Harvey, who lived with her mother, Hilza, ended up befriending the unusual man, which led to him becoming a regular visitor to the woman's neglected mansion. Mansion? Oh, Shotty Ridge? Would help the older woman with chores, such as mowing the lawn. Okay, and found him a little cougar. 14 dogs and 40 cats. With this newfound friendship, 40 it cats. seemed like things might be looking up for the eccentric man. With the amount of animals in the house and the fact that the two elderly women he better start killing the animals after them properly, it Boy. was no surprise when a neighbor reported Miss Harvey to the health authorities for the mess that was her home. Upon inspection, medics found that both Miss Harvey and her mother were in need of urgent hospital treatment due to the unsanitary conditions that they had been living in. Unfortunately though, it was too late for Hilza Harvey and she died at the age of 70. Hey. With her mother gone, uh, Miss Harvey Let's decided stop. to invite Martin to live with her in the mansion, to which he happily accepted. Uh -huh. Though it was never proven, some people believe that the couple's relationship went beyond that Let me of fix just this real quick. Y'all can't even see the, uh... yeah. Uh, yeah, guess. The two started spending large amounts of Miss Harvey's money, including buying more than 30 new cars in less than three years. They also went shopping daily and ate out at restaurants. With all of that money, his first real friend, and a chance to be normal, you might think that Martin would finally start to be better. But you'd be wrong. At around the same time that the future killer moved in with the lottery heiress, he was reassessed for his pension disability and the outcome was even worse than before. The What's psychiatrist real? attached a note to his assessment, which read, father protects him from any occasion which might upset him as he continually threatens violence. Martin what? tells me he would like to go around shooting people. It would be unsafe to allow Martin out of his parents' control. Yo! Yeah, <laughs> look, you saw I see at the bottom, ignoring the biggest red flag, clear as day. You would think that with such a shocking and disturbing evaluation, that Martin would be taken to a mental health facility Something. to be monitored. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case. And so, although he didn't live with his parents anymore, they were always close by to keep an eye on him. In 1991, Miss Harvey decided to buy a 29 hectare farm yeah. called Torresville in the small township of Copping. Both she and Martin moved into the new house together to the displeasure of their See, neighbors who disapproved of their relationship. Not only did they not like the relationship, but all of the locals were very wary of this new and unusual man. Late at night, he would roam around the neighborhood, firing his air rifle at dogs when they barked at him. He would also fire Bro. it at tourists as they stopped to buy don't care about a stall on the highway. Not signs of a mentally stable man. It was no wonder why people tried to avoid him at all costs. You know, but I would move, move cities. On the 20th of October, 1992, Miss Harvey had passed away. Although the case is still a bit dubious as to how Don't tell me that me actually her. occurred, the story goes that she and Martin were traveling in the car together with Miss Harvey's two dogs when it suddenly veered onto the wrong side of the road and hit an oncoming car head on. Miss Harvey and her two dogs were instantly killed, and Martin suffered ah. severe neck and back injuries. Police no demons don't die. Potential role in the incident, as he had been known to lunge for the steering wheel whilst the car was moving. He had caused Miss Harvey to crash three times already by doing this. He Ms. been Harvey trying to kill her. Been so fearful of Martin that she had even confided in her neighbors that he was the reason why she couldn't drive faster than 37 miles per hour. Although police did investigate him, Martin told them it was the dogs roaming around freely which caused the crash, and he was subsequently no longer seen as a suspect. After her death, Martin was named the sole beneficiary the wheel, of Ms. Harvey's will. He came into possession of assets totaling $550,000. However, so he could buy more because guns. of Martin's low IQ, he wasn't able to look after his own finances, and so his mother applied for and was granted a guardianship order to place Martin's assets under the management of public trustees, which ended up being his father. I knew his dad was going to pass away. I just knew. Well, Something about what he's doing just resembles fatherless after behavior. After Miss Harvey's death, 
Martin went back to live with his mother, whilst his father looked after the farm that his son had inherited. It was around this time that his father, Maurice Byron, tried to buy a small bed and breakfast near Port Arthur. However, before he could get his finances in order, the building was bought by another couple, David and Nolene Martin. Martin tried to buy the business off of the couple, but they refused. In the months that followed, his father, Maurice Byron, fell into a deep depression, which he often blamed Martin for. And on the 16th of August, 1993, divers found his body in the lake of the property with no! a giant weight belt around his neck. No! This would later Martin is just out here murdering folks! pushed Martin over the edge. The death was ruled as a suicide, although there are those who believe that Martin actually killed I'm not going to put it against him, but I'm not going to say he did it. his money, which his father had financial guardianship over. In the aftermath of his father's death, Martin inherited his $550,000, which Miss Harvey had left for him, as well as $250,000. Look what money make us. Now that he was man, alone, look what money Martin's make Martin do. An eccentric personality started showing through more and more. He was often seen sporting a gray linen suit, a cravat, lizard skin shoes, and a Panama hat, and would try to talk to random strangers, telling them that he had a well-paying career. As his mental health declined and his need for companionship grew, I'm Martin to get would often go on multiple trips overseas just so that he could talk to people on the plane. Forced to be polite, people would have to talk to him. However, uh -huh. they still felt that he was incredibly creepy. But this was not enough to satisfy his dire need for friends, and his mental health got even worse. In late 1995, Martin became suicidal after deciding that he had had enough. The big room, man, you gotta learn to be by yourself, man. When I tried to be friendly to You don't always need somebody by your away, side, bro. He said in an interview. Because not everybody in always gonna be there. Martin no quickly cap. turned to alcohol, and in the six months prior to the Port Arthur massacre, his consumption increased exponentially. According to Martin, he first thought of the plan for Port Arthur four to 12 weeks before it took place and based it off the Dunblane massacre, which had happened in Scotland, UK, only one month prior to Martin's attack. At some point during the years leading up to the That's how it works. attack, Martin the school shooters be inspired to check. No cap. Y'all ever, y'all ever notice how when one school shooting happened, like seven more happened like the next week. One self-loading battle rifle Sad and me. a USAS 12 automatic shotgun. He also visited the Port Arthur historic site multiple times in the months leading up to the tragic event and bought a large sports bag which he said needed to be strong enough to hold large amounts of ammunition. It seemed that Martin was determined to go through with his plan. On the 28th of April, 1996, Martin put his plan in action. He was unusually awoken at 6 a.m. by his alarm clock. During interviews after the massacre, his girlfriend of the time and his remaining family said that it was strange, as he had never used the alarm clock before. At around 9.45 a.m., after his girlfriend had left for the day, Martin left his home and headed toward Port Arthur, along with all of his weapons and his bag full of ammo. By 11.45 a.m., he had arrived at the Seascape Bed and Breakfast, the very one that his father had been unable to buy. Martin apparently believed that the owners, the Martins, had deliberately bought the property. Don't tell me he wouldn't kill them first. And blamed them for his father's depression, which all No, Martin, no, him. Martin, after, no. He decided that they would- No, Martin, the Martin, Martin, no. Martin fatally shot Come the on, Martin. in the guest room of their house before making his way to Port Arthur. Martin they the were Martins. the first Jeez. two victims of his devastating massacre. Once at Port Arthur, Martin went into the broad That's two pack, down, two carrying bodies. Carrying his large blue sports bag. He ordered a meal and made small talk with the tourists in the small shop, acting as if he was just another visitor on a day out. Unfortunately, his plans were much more sinister. Martin. After finishing his meal, Martin moved toward the back no, of the cafe, no, which had stop around it. 60 to 70 no, no, no. in it at the time, and set up a video camera on an empty table. Okay, I thought you were going to shoot the cafe. AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and started firing into the crowd of innocent people within only 15 seconds. That is crazy, bro. I'm sorry for pausing, but bro, just imagine you just chilling with your family at IHOP at Waffle House in the morning. 
Dude put down his bag and just start spraying everybody in the... Bro, this is insane. The cold-blooded killer had fired 17 shots, killing 12 people and injuring another 10. Martin then walked towards the gift shop That's 14. where people had tried to hide and fired 12 more times, killing another eight people and wounding two more. Man, that's 22. Outside of the well, cafe, the a group of people had gathered, believing the gunshots to be part of a reenactment play. Martin took this opportunity to refill his ammo and leave the cafe, only to callously shoot into the crowd in the car park. Oh. Yeah, Martin the Menace. Yeah, your name Martin the Menace. Double M. He is. He's over there. I can't believe it. Martin then got into his car and drove away, leaving four more people dead and six more injured. Wait, that's Only like 300 meters. Down that's more than 24 folks. I was at 22. That's like 26 now. Oh, it said 35. Oh, I thought it was 20. Jeez, boy. Madeline Meekark. Martin saw the family as he drove and pulled over, not knowing Martin. what had just happened down the port. Nanette had no idea how dangerous the man was. In the blink of an eye, Martin shot and killed Nanette and Madeline, who she was carrying in her arms. Alana tried to run away, however, in an act of true heartlessness. Martin chased after her and killed it's her in a single shot. Continuing with his rampage, Martin stole a gold BMW after killing all four of its occupants. He then drove a that's short what, distance down the road and pulled up alongside a white Toyota with a couple inside. He took out one of his weapons and ordered the male occupant of the car to get into the boot of the BMW before then shooting that's the 34. female driver. At around 2.10 in the afternoon, the mass murderer returned to the Seascape guest house, set the stolen car on fire, and took his hostage inside where the bodies of the Martins still lay. During this time, two police officers had been called about the roadside murders, tried to approach Martin. However, he opened fired on them, causing them to hide in a ditch and become pinned down. It wasn't until around 9 p.m. that a special operations group of the Tasmania police team arrived on the scene. They rescued the pinned down officers and for the next 18 hours, a tense standoff between Martin and the police took place. At first, the police tried to negotiate with the killer, but it was cut short when the battery on Martin's phone ran out. His only demand had been that he wanted to be transported to an airport in an army helicopter. During negotiations, Martin ended up killing his hostage, That's 35. bringing the total number of people killed in his monstrous rampage yeah. to 35, 35, whilst a further 23 were injured. Not Next including morning, the two other kids. I know he killed his dad Martin and the old lady. The guest house That's really 37, but 35 so far, yeah. This didn't work, and instead, the killer was captured and taken to Royal Hobart Hospital. They took to him to the hospital? Treated, which he received in the fire. He was kept under heavy guard the entire time. Thirty-five people. After his arrest, Martin was held in custody without the chance of bail. Whilst he was awaiting trial, he was examined by court-appointed psychiatrist Ian Sale, who believed that Martin possibly suffered from a mixture of conduct disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity, and Asperger's syndrome. Not that that excused the horror that he had just committed. Eventually, Martin was judged fit to stand trial, which happened on the 7th of November, 1996. Initially, the mass murderer pleaded not guilty, but his court-appointed lawyer, John Avery, so I hate to be that lawyer, to change his mind and plead guilty to all charges. Two weeks later, Martin was given 35 consecutive life sentences, one yeah. for each victim killed in his attack. He was also given. What's the Illuminati said? You're done. It's no way out of this one. <laughs> it's no way out of that one. An additional 1,652 years in prison for attempted murder and grievous physical harm to numerous people. The sentence was issued with no chance of parole. No chance. The first of its kind. So it's safe to he say don't need to get out. he's never getting out. Throughout his imprisonment, the once formidable killer attempted to take his own life on eight. Oh, uh, of course, days. 35 life. Boy, what? In 2007, when he tried to slit his own throat with a razor blade, forcing him to be briefly hospitalized before being returned to prison. In recent exclusive interviews, 
Martin has been documented to have become severely overweight as he refused to join in on exercise in the prison court. Might as well, you ain't had a rest of your life. have declined even more mentally to the point where he is willing to trade sexual favors for chocolate. I mean, of as course, he's in there for the rest of his life. Unremorseful mass murder. Sexual favors for chocolate, you're down bad. Security, Risden Prison. His mind all because types of, of the twisted. weapons that Martin used in the massacre, along with the fact that he was able to legally me for chocolate is crazy. That's... The guns, despite his history of violence, the Australian government decided that some serious reforms were needed in terms of their gun laws. The legal ownership and use of self-loading rifles, self-loading shotguns, and pump-action shotguns were either banned or heavily restricted. And yes. a buyback scheme was initiated in which over 643,000 firearms were handed back, which cost the government around $350 million. Since the Port Arthur massacre, there have been many conspiracy theories behind what actually happened that day. Some people believe that it was a setup by the Australian government so that they could enact stricter gun laws, as there had been a number of mass shootings before the Port Arthur one took place. Others believe that Martin wasn't actually the shooter, as witness descriptions didn't match his appearance. These are just some of the theories that people have come up with. However, none have been proven to be true. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Martin Bryant. And why don't you go ahead and click- Bro, do you see that title, bro? What the f- bro. Bro, this channel is actually crazy. Bro, what? The 13 year old who butchered a what? Dog. All right. Anyways, yo, let me know what y'all think, bro. Do y'all think he really did it? Do y'all think he did it? Do y'all think uh, he deserves to be in? I uh, not even does he deserve, but bro, like, man, fuck that dude, man. And that's him, bro. Whoever, bro, to kill 35 people in 20. He killed, obviously he killed over 35, but they couldn't find all the bodies. Can you know, bro? No way. No way. No way. I feel like his real amount is 50 plus. He was a body snatcher for no reason. Like, bro, just really felt like killing folks. He would just kill them. But yeah, man, this was a sick story. But man, I had to do something for Sunday, bro. Because, you know, I just sit down, relax, watch a 20 minute video with your boy Kings, eh? I appreciate it if y'all made it this far. If you made it this far, comment down, uh, Below an apple if you made it this far. And uh yeah, man. Comment down below in the show and see. Like the vid. Subscribe if you're new. I'm out, bro. Peace.